So I'm, I'm wondering if you can explain that and, and talk a little bit about what makes a good partnership versus perhaps a, a, a riskier one in, in education. Sure. Absolutely. And I'll start with there's really broadly three types of partnerships that I think about in education. There's the sales distribution partnerships. So you would sell your product through a, a reseller. There's the partnerships with other ed tech companies or tech companies or education companies. Um, and then there's research partnerships. So schools or nonprofits or research entities. And these are three very different functions, all of which the statement applies. And we have to make sure there is something in it for them because people tend to underestimate how much time goes into maintaining and running a partnership. So if there is not really strong, unique strategic value to both sides, there really isn't, it's not worth the time. And so the analogy equation, one plus one should equal five, not even three. It should be, it's so valuable and both sides see such tremendous value that is worth it for both of you. You as an ed tech company can offer some of these schools and research partners unique data methodologies that they couldn't otherwise have. Uh, some of these other ed tech companies, maybe an integration of your, of your two products has five times the value of either of your own two products. It typically doesn't make sense to do an integration with a product that doesn't have a lot of traction. So if you're approaching a bigger company, what's in it for them? Uh, why wouldn't they just say, okay, go ahead and use this if you want. If you have a free product also isn't often worth the integration because then they can just use it for free and there's not a ton of value and there's not enough penetration to make it worth it also comes into that. And then a sales and reseller partnership, there really needs to be a, a supplemental component to your go-to-market strategy. It's not the only strategy. And this is where I see sometimes, especially earlier stage companies getting hung up. You need a sales distribution go-to-market strategy that is directly with a relationship with your customers because you will inherently lose it if you're just selling your product through a partner, through a reseller. And so in all of these cases, there needs to be something very unique that you offer and something unique that the partnership brings for it to be worth it. A lot of companies will just have a, a no partnership policy because it's not worth it. And the other thing to think about too is that there's any kind of sales integration or any kind of technical integration there's data implications of it. There's breach implications of that. If your partner does something you don't like, you've already aligned with them, it's messy. If there's a data breach, God forbid, because of an integration, you are not off the hook for that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so all of these things are really a reason to pilot a partnership, play nicely with other people, but not really invest any of your, your, your core resources initially in focusing on partnership until you have something to offer. Until you have something to offer to schools, to, to researchers, to other tech companies, to the resellers and distributors that you're going through, there's nothing stopping them from selling all of your competitors and not caring while taking 20% of your margins and ensuring you can never sell directly to those customers. As you service the relationship, for other integrations, why would they care if you don't have something to offer? Or worse, maybe they think, oh, that would be really easy to build. We should do that. But you gave them the idea and they didn't think about it. And then for schools, nonprofit researchers, et cetera, you have to have something to offer. And so the reason I care so much about this is that A, there's inherent risks with a partnership. It could be technical. It could be reputational. It could be time. Um, and people tend to underestimate that. And it's also not a substitute for having your own product roadmap or research strategy or sales marketing go-to-market strategy. And oftentimes partnerships overlook that um, and tend just not to be worth it. If you're a tiny company in education, why would a big company care to partner with you? Why wouldn't they just say, yeah, sell your customers, we'll sell to ours, and we'll play nicely. And so that's where this, I think it's a, a proverb, I've heard it attributed to a couple different people, but you can't reason with a tiger with your head, it's in, when your head is in its mouth, there's nothing in it for them. And it could even be a risky partnership if uh, you've given them ideas they didn't otherwise have, or push them to look at your competitors who are bigger because it's an interesting idea, but you don't have enough to offer. All of these are reasons that partnerships are not a substitute for other, other direct strategies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like any healthy relationship, you need neediness harms it, <laughs> you need a, a equal standing between the, the partners. Absolutely, you have to offer something big mm -hmm. in return. Mm -hmm. Go into another quote from you that I found fascinating and I was curious to hear your response or elaboration to talking about, you know, growth marketing as a topic, quantitative data is often, you know, holds a high place, right? I kind of see like there's marketers who are more creatively focused and you know, might be interested in design and copy and, you know, art direction and then 
others, especially surrounding the term growth marketing, where data rules. That's why this quote that you said stood out to me, and it was, quantitative data alone can drive worse decisions than no data altogether. So can you explain that a little bit? Absolutely. The reason for that is that we tend to make lots and lots of unmitigated assumptions if we have just quantitative data without qualitative market context, and we're not aware we're making that. So if we have no data, we are very aware of the speculations we're making, we're very aware of the hypotheses we're drawing, and we're looking for ways to validate them. If we have just quantitative data, we can tell stories from it. And I like this quote from Sean Ellis. He says that, what it, was it quantitative data? All of the quantitative data in the world can only tell us what people are doing, not why people are doing it. And really our goal is to replicate the why, why people have engaged with something so we can do more of it. If we're just looking at dashboards alone, we're not talking to customers, we're not getting into schools, we have no idea what's driving that. And so the factors that we attribute to driving the success may be exactly wrong and what we look to replicate may be exactly wrong. And this is where a lot of really, really bad decisions come from because they're all assumptions and we don't realize it. This is where statements like email marketing just doesn't work for us, see, look at the data. We need to do more events, see, look at the data. Maybe we've been at all the events that'll be effective and now we're just seeing the same customers again and we've paid a lot of money for it. And so we, these are all things that we would never be able to conclude from a dashboard alone. And if you stick a dashboard up in any room, you can draw whatever conclusion you want. And so data really should be validating and supporting our strategies and the very specific hypotheses and experiments we're running, but not setting strategies. So if we have just quantitative data, we can tell any story we want from it. Five different people will make five different conclusions. And so if we have no idea why people are behaving the way they are or what's to, to credit for it, we can't replicate it. So it's worse than not having it all together because we're not listening anymore. We think we know. And so now we're not listening. And that's why I say that. And we, the goal is to replicate. I often see uh, a lot of just the ubiquity of dashboards being the result of people who feel undue accountability. And this is a, a business school professor who said that you don't get results by pounding on the table. If people feel like they are driven to a single metric, any single metric is inherently gameable and it drives really myopic behavior that we don't want to see that'll often compromise long-term results, but we won't know it. If we have just a, and I call these tension metrics, I, I took it from someone, sorry, I don't know who they were, but tension metrics, something that whatever the objective is, and we started with the business objective, we can't game a certain metric without pulling on the other. And so in marketing, this may be, if we care about marketing qualified leads, we also would look at the conversion rate and equally importantly, the retention cohorts. So if somebody who came in through Facebook, if we only have 20% of those customers a year later, we need to know that because whatever we promised them and offered them in that channel isn't what they saw. So the retention needs to be paired there as well. The conversion rate needs to be paired there as well. For customer support, if we care about a certain ticket resolution time, we also care about customer satisfaction scores. So whatever the, the metric is, it can't be standalone, it can't be gameable because that's how we get really bad behavior. This is where we see things like Wells Fargo files account creation because it's all they cared about. This is where we see things like the GameStop CEO repurchasing the stock to drive up the share price. Great, there's a third less stock, now it's worth more, but you've lost all of that money that could have been reinvested in the company and haven't actually helped. His goal was to drive up the share price. He did it, right? Wells Fargo goal was new account creation. They did it. Whatever your goal is, it is very, very easy to hit a single metric. But if it isn't rooted against the overall business objectives and tied in with other departmental objectives, we will not like the results a year later. Mm -hmm. Right. So then I, I appreciate that example of the tension metric metrics you said. Yeah, where the one, one helps to kind of keep the other one honest. Right, if you're getting tons of leads, but, but they're low conversion and you're looking at both, then you know something is off. Right. Uh, but if you have just the leads, then, you know, um, um, you know it's as if uh, coming to education, if, you know, grades alone or, you know, completion of assignments or something like that, you know, people always respond to their incentives in a, in a smart way when you, <laughs> when you, when you make it focused. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's why they should be rooted in overall business objectives right? You can create whatever metrics you want to tell whatever story you want. And if they're not paired against the other departments they impact, if product metrics are completely independent from sales and marketing, 
any one of those can be gained and they're not necessarily telling of the overall story. And if they're not mapping to the overall business objectives, it's possible we're looking at secondary metrics that don't even matter. And all we're mapping towards are things that aren't important. And all of this happens when we have just quantitative data alone and we haven't paired metrics against ones that uh, really matter cross-functionally. Mm -hmm.